This program is made possible in part by a grant from Regions Bank. From Catherine Dunham Hall on the campus of Southern Illinois University Edwardsville, the Lincoln Academy of Illinois presents the 2005 Convocation and Investiture of Laureates, Excellence in Action. A business leader committed to improving the quality of life in his community. A Pulitzer Prize winning reporter and columnist respected for his shoe leather approach to journalism. A food scientist whose research is helping people live longer, healthier lives. A pioneer in electrical engineering whose inventions have literally made the world a brighter place. An Olympic champion who is shaping the lives of youngsters in her hometown. And a visionary educator designing new learning experiences for mathematics and science students. Since its founding more than four decades ago, the Lincoln Academy of Illinois has recognized a select group of individuals who have brought honor to their state in the spirit of that most famous Illinoisan, Abraham Lincoln. As laureates of the Lincoln Academy, each person represents a lifetime commitment to leadership and service to humanity. Tonight is the 41st annual convocation of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois, and during those 41 years, what we have done is to convey to the people of Illinois who merit it the state's highest award, the Order of Lincoln. And it's to thank them for the lives they have led, how they have benefited their fellow human beings, uh, and to have other people emulate the conduct that they've led in their lives. These people really symbolize the best of Illinois. Uh, they also join a list of those who are really great pioneers in their own right, and their forebears of over 200 people who over these years have been awarded the Order of Lincoln. These people are, are just leaders of the community and we're very proud of them and we're particularly proud of the people who will join them this evening. The Lincoln Academy of Illinois is patterned upon the learned academies of Europe and is unique among the 50 states. Members of the nonpartisan, not-for-profit Lincoln Academy are appointed by the governor who also serves as its president. Each year, the Academy meets to select the laureates who are to receive the Order of Lincoln Medallion, the state's highest honor for individual achievement. Its colors of red, violet, and green symbolize the state bird, the cardinal, the state flower, the violet, and the leaves of the state tree, the oak. In addition to its laureates, the Lincoln Academy also recognizes future leaders by honoring the outstanding senior students at each of Illinois' four-year degree-granting institutions in ceremonies held each fall at the Illinois State Capitol. We regret that the president of the Academy, Governor Rod Blagojevich, is unable to attend this convocation. In his stead is Dr. Thomas F. Schwartz, Illinois' state historian. We appreciate that a number of prominent government officers, legislators, and judges are with us this evening. We thank you for attending. And now for the key part of a convocation, the traditional ceremony when we recognize the work of distinguished Illinoisans, citizens by birth or residence. I now ask that Mr. Ernest R. Wish, a laureate and regent of the Academy, read the citation for laureate Edward A. Brennan. Mr. Wish. Born in Chicago, Edward A. Brennan is formerly the CEO of Sears Roebuck & Company, one of the world's largest and best-known retailers. He has earned the respect of the business community and the gratitude of many civic and philanthropic organizations. A 1955 graduate of Marquette University, Mr. Brennan began his career at Sears at age 22. Until his retirement in 1995, Mr. Brennan led Sears through a decade of change that improved the company's bottom line and increased shareholder value significantly. Since retiring from Sears, he has remained active in business by serving on the boards of Allstate Insurance, 3M, Exelon Corporation, McDonald's, and American Airlines. But business has never been Mr. Brennan's only interest. He has chaired the boards of trustees of DePaul and Marquette Universities. He has lent his expertise to numerous civic and philanthropic causes, serving as chairman of the board of the United Way of America, 
the Museum of Science and Industry, and Rush University Medical Center. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to present to you as a laureate of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois, Mr. Edward A. Brennan. My grandfather started with Sears in 1898, and he had a big family, he had eight kids, and six of the eight kids ended up going to work for Sears, including my father. Uh, so we've had a, we've had a, we've had a, a direct uh, connection with Sears from 890, 1898 until almost the end of the century. Edward Brennan worked his way through high school and college in the clothing business. Upon his graduation from Marquette University, he followed in the footsteps of generations of men in his family. I wanted to be in retailing, and I wanted to be with the best, and uh, so on a kind of on a whim one day, I gave them a call and went over and had an interview and, and was hired, and was hired as a salesman uh, in Madison, Wisconsin, selling men's furnishings. Brennan's climb up the corporate ladder at Sears coincided with the explosive growth of America's suburbs. There was an opportunity to build a huge number of stores. And so in those days, through the 50s, 60s, 70s, there was a, a, a huge expansion of retailing, uh, and all of us participated in it. And as part of that, the shopping center developed, and the specialty store concept with the big box stores, so to speak, uh, ended up being the core of a, of a mall, a regional shopping center. Brennan was elected president of the company in 1980, and in 1985, as president and CEO of Sears, he was making sure the company's image and merchandising changed with the times. Running a big Sears store is one of the great satisfaction jobs that you could possibly imagine. And so I, I love the, the, the detail of the store. And we launched a program in the early 80s uh, called the Store of the Future. We, we took three stores in three parts of the country, uh, in Texas, in Boston, and here in Chicago, and we took a third of the store and we worked on bringing it up to date, and then ultimately put together a single store, and then and over a period of years we remodeled uh, all of our stores to, com to conform to the, to the store of the future. In the early 90s, Brennan earned the respect of the business community by refocusing Sears on retailing while spinning off Dean Witter Financial Services, Coldwell Banker Real Estate, and Allstate Insurance. Today, Allstate alone is $40 billion. Morgan Stanley, which we subsequently merged uh, with, uh, Dean Witter merged with, with Morgan Stanley, has a market cap of $60 billion. And Sears has a market cap of 25 or $30 billion. So if you look at the, the value created, we went from about $10 billion to arguably about $100 billion in, in value. Brennan retired from Sears in 1995, but not from corporate life. As executive chairman of AMR, the parent firm of American Airlines, he led the nation's largest airline through a difficult restructuring in 2003. Uh, we were about that far from bankruptcy, not a secret. Everybody in the, in the industry knew that. And, and, uh, and, and, and that's a scary thing to go through. And so when you, ha you go through a scary time, you need stability. And, uh, uh, and I guess I, you know, I was kind of part of, of, of that stabilization. I'm extremely proud of what's happened. We, we just finished the second quarter. We made money in the second quarter, first time since 2000 uh, that we've had a, a, a profitable quarter. The company is stable. Uh, we have a, a strong cash position, and, uh, and, uh, and, and the planes are full today. Brennan's busy civic life has seen him chair the board of trustees of both Marquette and DePaul universities in recent years. I've had great satisfaction from that. It's a, it's a whole different world in some ways. In other respects, it's the same. And, uh, but you, you don't make decisions in quite the same manner uh, in, in a, in a not-for-profit world as you do. In the corporate world, you make the decision and bang, you do it. In, in, uh, there's a little more reflection that takes place in, in the other world. Brennan is currently in his seventh year leading the board of Rush University Medical Center. There is no way you can be a mediocre player today in the healthcare industry and survive. And, and so you have to have good people who run places very professionally, who are at the cutting edge of what's going on, and have an incredibly good medical staff. That's what we have at, at Rush. 
Brennan says giving back is incredibly important when you're privileged to all the things he and other CEOs have been able to do, especially in his hometown of Chicago. And there's great satisfaction from that. Chicago is a vibrant community. I mean, we arguably are one of the best cities in the, in, in the, in the world in which to live. Our, our quality of life here is extraordinary. And a big piece of that quality of life is, is the result of the involvement of the business community. Brennan hints that he might have a few more retirements ahead of him, but he plans on keeping busy. I'm not going to retire. <laughs> I will do something. You know, I may not do as much as I'm doing now. I like to work. I have a full-time office. God willing, you know, as long as, as long as I have good health and I have energy, and uh, so far, so good. My life experience has been, I think, an example of the great opportunity that exists for all of us here in Illinois and in our great country. I left Chicago to be a store manager in Baltimore in 1966 and came back as president in, in 1980. But what I have found over these years, especially in the last 10 or 12 years, is that you get back so much more when you do things to help others than you give. And it gives you the opportunity to make so many wonderful friends people from all walks of life. I have been very fortunate uh, to live in this great state uh, and, and, and in this wonderful, wonderful country. And I look upon this as one of the, one of the great nights of my life. Thank you very much. Born in Chicago Heights, David S. Broder is a highly regarded Pulitzer Prize winning political columnist and commentator known for his keen insights, balanced reporting, and hard work. Mr. Broder started his newspaper career at the Bloomington Pantograph. He joined the staff of the Washington Post in 1966 and began his much-read and well-respected column. In 1973, he won the Pulitzer Prize for a distinguished commentary. Mr. Broder's twice-weekly column appears in more than 300 newspapers, a demonstration of his relevance far beyond the Beltway. U.S. News echoed the opinions of Mr. Broder's fellow reporters and colonists when it declared him the unchallenged dean of political reporters. Mr. Broder will tell you that he is just doing his job. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to present to you as a laureate of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois, Mr. David S. Broder. The prospects for expanding No Child Left Behind, I think, are minimal this year, John. There's not much room for it on the calendar, and there doesn't seem to be much push for it from the White House. I think that David Broder, every time he shows up on our set, brings with him a certain gravitas. You know that what he tells you is well reported and is going to be true, and that he sees through all, all the spin. David Broder grew up talking politics at the family dinner table. You can't have lived in Chicago and not uh, know that uh, politics is the most fascinating and in some ways also the toughest game in town. Broder studied political science at the University of Chicago where he earned his bachelor's and master's degrees. I had a wonderful American history course with a professor named Meredith Wilson, not the music man, but the same name, uh, who taught us by exposing us to the original documents. We didn't have a textbook, but we read the arguments back and forth from revolutionary times on. And it was a great way to learn American history because it rid you of the notion that there was something inevitable about the way this country developed. After a two-year stint in the Army, Broder landed his first newspaper job at the Bloomington Pantograph in 1950. It's a terrific paper in a wonderful community. And the f people that took us in there not only taught both of us the rudiments of journalism. I'd never had a journalism class and didn't know a thing about what I was doing, but they taught us and uh, became great friends. And it's a wonderful, was a wonderful way to start out. 
Broder's first brush with the presidency came in the early 50s when then actor Ronald Reagan spoke at the local General Electric plant and at nearby Eureka College, Reagan's alma mater. I started covering Ronald Reagan long before he was running for office. Told him when he was when I was covering his first presidential campaign, I said, I think I've been hearing your speeches longer than anybody else. And the thing with Reagan, of course, was when he had a line that worked, he never dropped it from the repertory. So there were some lines that I'd heard back in Eureka that were still part of the, of the shtick. Dwight Eisenhower was in the White House when Broder joined the staff of Congressional Quarterly in 1955. His Illinois connections proved invaluable to him on Capitol Hill in the early days. Well, the two senators from Illinois were terrific to me. I mean, both Dirksen and Douglas uh, welcomed me, and they and their staffs were more than generous in helping me figure out what was going on. But you need that kind of help because it's a complicated world up there. And uh, as we're seeing even now with the fight over the judgeships, uh, uh, people have one sort of public posture and a, often a very different private negotiating stance. Broder has covered every presidential campaign since 1960, beginning with the former Washington Star, the New York Times, and then the Washington Post, where he's been on staff since 1966. As a human being, I think probably the person who was least affected by being president was Jerry Ford. I mean, he never expected to be president. It had not been part of his ambition. And he never really changed in the presidency. He was good old Jerry Ford from beginning to end there. Uh, of all of them, I would say probably the, the largest in historical terms uh, was Lyndon Johnson. I mean, he was, he was bigger than life size and with both strengths and weaknesses, but uh, he was a force. Today's 24-hour news cycle has reporters constantly on deadline, but Broder is grateful the Washington Post still believes in good old-fashioned shoe leather journalism. Well, we practice that assiduously in our political reporting at the Washington Post. I mean, literally. We are out walking precincts, knocking on people's doors, talking to folks in their own homes, <clears throat> and asking them, what's on your mind? How do things look to you? How is our country doing? How is the president doing? What do you think about Congress and so on? It's hard work, but you learn more that way than from any other kind of reporting that I've ever come across. And I suspect that there's a secret side of David which goes out dancing every night after the show. But in truth, I think what he really does is he sits in his office, surrounded by newspapers, surrounded by papers, taking his phone calls, recently having learned how to use email, and figures out what the truth is when you dig through all the crap that you get in Washington, and you know that when you read his column, you're going to get the truth. Broder laments the partisanship that characterizes today's winner-take-all politics, but he has a deep and abiding respect for the political process and the men and women who put themselves on the line to run for elected office. I really have a great admiration for people who are willing to gamble with their reputations, put their names on the ballot, invite the public for whatever reason to judge them as compared to somebody else. Most of us would run like hell the other direction to avoid being in that situation. So I admire the politicians who are willing to do it. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an emotional moment. <clears throat> I want to thank you for those kind words and for your willingness to sacrifice whatever little credibility you might have built up in this community on my behalf. <laughs> I have a very simple statement to make. Everything that I learned of importance in my life, I learned here in Illinois. I owe this state so much, and now thanks to the generosity of the Lincoln Academy, I owe it something more. So thank you all. Born in Waltonville, Illinois, George Inglet is a world-renowned food scientist who has pioneered in developing products for those seeking better nutrition and healthier diets.
Dr. Inglet is a pioneer in the development of nutraceuticals, health-enhancing products derived from nature. He electrified the nutrition and diet food world in the 1990s with the announcement that he had created Oat Trim, a fat replacement product that does not affect the flavor and texture of foods. From combination of oats, barley, corn, and soybeans, he has created a series of patented trim technologies, which not only tastefully replace fat, but in some cases add nutritional benefits. Dr. Inglet is revered throughout the food science industry. Although few of us will ever understand the science involved in his work, all of us will enjoy the health benefits of his many discoveries, and people around the world will have a better, healthier lives because of him. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to present to you as a laureate of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois, Dr. George Inglet. We can make food products a lot more healthy with fewer calories, which should be helpful in the areas of fighting obesity, heart disease, and diabetes, as well as many of the other problems that face people. The recipes being tried out in this test kitchen may one day help you live a longer, healthier life. As one of the world's foremost authorities on food science and technology, George England has pioneered a new generation of cereal-based fat replacements, popular in hundreds of food items in recent years. England's love of science dates back to his childhood in southern Illinois, where he started his own laboratory as a high school student. I made a big sign and put it up on the telephone pole. It was England Research Laboratories. So I actually had some labels printed for some cosmetics. I made some cold cream and some other creams put it in bottles and was found a few drug stores that would put it on the shelf. England earned a PhD in biochemistry at the University of Iowa and entered the corporate world where his early work took him to Africa and Asia in search of natural sweeteners. We were looking for many activities of which sweeteners were one of them because at that time cyclamate and saccharin were on the blacklist basically and so we were looking for a replacement an intense sweetener that would replace them. England joined the U.S. Department of Agriculture's National Center for Agricultural Research in Peoria in 1967, where he led the Cereal Properties Laboratory before taking over as chief scientist. Our role is one of the leading centers for utilization research. Utilization research is the application uh, finding new uh, uses for agricultural products as well as byproducts and uh, bio-based products and uh, as well as all the ramifications of, of crops and how they react to uh, or in the marketplace. In the 1980s, England's research into how enzymes break down the starches found in oats led him to make an important discovery. So in this process, I found some nice white powders when I worked on oats. And about this time, my wife had suffered a near fatal heart attack so uh, the doctor suggested she lose weight so in the process of taking care of my wife and the home situation I looked at my research and said you know these things might be useful for reducing calories and making better health so this first product was called oat trim oat trim because it was a fat replacer we could put it in food products and replace some of the fat. Therefore, the food would have less fewer calories in it. The discovery of oat trim led to the creation of an entire line of patented trim technologies, the latest being calorie trim, or C-trim, cereal-based products that replace fat while providing the texture and taste of fat with fewer calories, plus the added benefits of soluble fiber. Most of the time, you wouldn't know that it's there. Unless you're buying products that are called low fat or good for your heart or basically some health claim related to that food. So we can make food products that are healthy but yes contain less calories and at the same time we add the soluble fiber beta glucan. We can add it to items such as uh, chocolates, we can add it to items like brownies 
Uh, we can put it in snacks, such as this. Sea trim can be added to other foods like chocolate to make snacks like brownies that not only taste good, they really are good for you. We're using the dark chocolate, which has also got antioxidants in it. So this, you can say, has a double whammy. Antioxidants and super carbs, or the sea trim, the calorie trim. England says research gives him the constant challenge of finding something new, novel, and creative. But it's even more rewarding when your discovery is useful. Basically, it's, it comes from the mind. Your mind has to be challenged in the different aspects of nature, society, chemical changes, or the things that are going on around you. So if you are challenged, you enjoy the challenge and the change, particularly in this case where we're relating to chemistry and the changes that take place in terms of the different chemical uh, entities and what we're dealing with. So to be able to say that we have some tools here the trim technology, that can be useful for humanity. This is important, and this is what I mean by doing something beyond the creativity, something beyond the excitement, something that's going to go out there into the world and be useful and applied. How is it? Good. And it's good for you. In Illinois, our agriculture makes it possible for millions to eat well along with the increasing health concerns about heart, cancer, diabetes, and other diseases. Eating well is important since much of the future is beyond our control and understanding. Abraham Lincoln said, I walk slowly, but I never walk backwards. May we all continue to follow his example as we walk forward down life's path choosing a healthier, happier, and longer life. It's my privilege to accept the honor for agriculture and science. Thank you all very much. Born in Ziegler, Illinois, Nick Honiak, Jr. is a scientist whose pioneering research on semiconductors has not only had a profound impact on the scientific world, but on our everyday lives. Dr. Holniak has been a leader in researching and developing semiconductors for five decades. In 1962, he was first to create visible spectrum lasers and light-emitting diodes. The latter is more widely known as LED technology. His work with semiconductors is based on complex formulas that baffle the uninitiated. But the result of his uh, research are evident in our everyday lives as we check the illuminated dials on our alarm clocks, watch movies on our DVD players, and use our computers. Inheriting the, his legacy are two generations of his students who carry on his reputation for innovation and integrity, some who are honored and pleased to be with him this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to present to you, as a laureate of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois, Dr. Nick Holniak, Jr. You can look at that and think that that's something hot. It's not anything hot. It's something that we would like to keep nice and cool. It's generating light electronically. Past, present, and future all have a place in Nick Holniak's laboratory at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. The inventor of the light-emitting diode says it all began with this tiny handmade device called the magic one. This is it, right there, right in my hand. This is the beginning. That's it. it it's the progenitor of LEDs. It's the progenitor of all the visible spectrum lasers that are used for reading DVDs and all that kind of stuff, it all sort of goes right back to this thing here. This, this is the first time anyone ever made these kind of substances into, into lasers and light emitters. 
The son of Slavic immigrants whose father mined coal in southern Illinois, Nick Holnyak worked for the Illinois Central Railroad as a teenager to help his family make ends meet. I lied about my age. I was 15 and claimed I was 16. So that I worked on an extra gang, and when the extra gang left, they put me on the local section crew. We were working 10 hours a day, six days a week for 65 cents an hour, uh, digging in ties. Everything was done by hand, and I was putting all of that aside. Holnyak enjoyed the quantitative sciences in high school and soon started attending extension classes before heading to the University of Illinois. There he was to study under his longtime mentor and friend, two-time Nobel laureate John Bardeen, one of the inventors of the transistor. You could tell that John was was it, figuring things out bigger time than other people, that his talent was richer, deeper, and that it, 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 there is an issue of judgment. Why do you work on some problems and not other problems? Where are payoff problems? After graduate school, Holnyak worked for Bell Telephone Labs and General Electric. At GE, he became the first to generate visible red light in 1962. My lasers, semiconductor lasers, are the first ones you can see with your eye, that the camera can see directly without special instruments. And there's a fun element in that. There's always a fun element in, in uncovering an idea and finding something that works and something that has more prospect than just the first finding. Because generally you think ahead a little bit and, and are working in an area where you think there's more than one, one aspect to this. If I find one nugget in the stream, I'm probably going to find a place where there's many nuggets. And so th there's something like dope about that that's drawing you and pulling you. Light emitting diodes now come in an ever increasing number of colors and can be found in everything from traffic signals to police car lights and hundreds of consumer and industrial electronic products. Work continues on an even brighter, more efficient LED that Holnyak calls the ultimate lamp. The one that I'm holding in my hand is somewhere between 50 and 60 percent quantum efficiency. By that I mean for every two electrons that goes in a terminal, a photon, a light particle, is coming out at us. And that's already getting to be pretty serious stuff. That's getting up here into this range. And, and the newer ones are actually up here higher and still on their way up. See, I won't live long enough to see the semiconductor, the LED, replace all existing lighting, but it's happening, and, and on the scale of like a logarithmic scale, 10 years, double it 20 years, double it again past 40 to 50, 100, it's happening, and the semiconductor lamp is going to prevail all the way. Holnyak's colleagues are now working to perfect a transistor laser with both electrical and optical signals. Rich has got an experimental device sitting under the microscope, and he's, he's focusing on it. And When perfected, the device may one day yield the latest revolution in the electronics industry. So we got this one thing, which is still a true transistor, but it's running as also a laser. It's both a laser and a transistor. Now, when you start integrating this on a single chip, we're talking about... Uh, we're, we're, we're talking about something that is a, a new chip that is faster than the chips that anybody's seeing in computers today. We're not talking about that being in a computer next year because it's going to take a while to get all this stuff done, and we're just at the front end of it. It all turns out to be the magic of the semiconductor in many ways, and, and our ability to stack these materials, grow these materials, process these materials, contact these materials, devise them with certain properties, and, and, and that hasn't been exhausted. Uh, there's still uh, games to play there. I have never run out of things to do. Uh, and my, my, my mind keeps working, my body complains, but my mind works. I'm delighted to receive this honor because I'm a native of the state of Illinois. I received all of my education here. I work here, and a lot of the people that I work with are obviously here in Illinois. Uh, Illinois has been my home. I'm delighted to be here. I'm happy that all of you are here, 
And I want to thank all of you and all the state people who have had a hand in this, including the ones up close to me and my colleagues who are here. One of them was mentioned because of what we're doing with a light emitting transistor, Milton Fing. And I'm not, I'm not doing that. I just badger him about that. And he's the one. And that, that is already a transistor laser, a new form of laser. So I personally think my vision about where the field goes is better than the young punks who are always on my back saying, we know where it's going. <laughs> Thank you. Born in East St. Louis, Illinois, Jacqueline Joyner Kersey is a world-class athlete known for her achievements on and off the track as a sportswoman, a community leader, and a role model for youth. In 1984, she won her first Olympic medal at the age of 22 in spectacular performances in the 1988, 1992, and 1996 games, she earned five more medals. She claimed two gold medals in the heptathlon. She won another gold medal and two bronze medals in the long jump. Along the way, she earned four world championship gold medals and broke records in the heptathlon, long jump, and hurdles. As head of the Jackie Joyner Kersey Youth Center Foundation, she spearheaded the drive to create a recreational and educational facility for disadvantaged youth in East St. Louis. The Jackie Joyner Kersey Center, completed in 2000, houses the local boys and girls club and, a host, um, and hosts a number of other community education and health programs. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to present to you as a laureate of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois, Ms. Jacqueline Joyner Kersey. Uh, one thing that I've always believed when it came to our, our young people is that if you provide them a safe place to go, a place that they can come into and show love, show them love and, and also be able to feed them, but then also teach them too in a sense of making them stronger academically as well as physically and, and spiritually. And so I believe in, you know, the total body, mind and spirit and having that and our young people, then they too would develop and grow, and eventually they will come back into the community and, and help make change come about. Jackie Joyner Kersey always dreamed of coming home to East St. Louis to give back to the people who loved her and sustained her from childhood to a career sports writers praised as the greatest female athlete of all time. Today, hundreds of children and young people are living her dream daily at the Jackie Joyner Kersey Youth Center a state-of-the-art boys and girls club that offers a wide range of educational and recreational programs throughout the East St. Louis area. Staff and volunteers stress values here, much like Jackie's mother Mary did for her children. My mom really stressed uh, academics. Uh, going to school, coming home, for the street light comes on then, if you can go to practice then you go. But uh, homework to, had to do that first. Coaches like Nino Fanoy also played an important role in molding her character while building her skills as an athlete. The relationship with Coach Fanoy and myself was always, will always be uh, a father figure, a mentor, someone that I know that if I am not going down the right path, that he would steer me back in the right direction. And he's going to be very honest and very open and very direct because he cared more about me as a person than what I could do on the athletic field. At 14, she won the first of four straight junior national track and field championships, but she was never quite sure of where it all might lead. When I was 14 and I saw the 76 Olympic Games on television, it all started to make sense to me that all the running that we were doing on a center track out in Lincoln Park, that now I see people, women on TV, doing the same things that we do every day. And then maybe, you know, I can go to the Olympics and I can get on TV. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that if I could make an Olympic team, then that really meant that I was good. Jackie Joyner earned a basketball scholarship to attend the University of California at Los Angeles. There, coached by Bob Kersey, who later became her husband, she began competing at the international level, becoming the dominant American athlete in the women's long jump and heptathlon, a demanding combination of seven speed and strength events. The one thing about the multi-events is that it, it really kept you humble in a sense because I might be able to run the hurdles well or jump well, but then I might have problems with the throwing event or then I might have problems with my endurance event. 
So whenever you thought you were on a high, then all of a sudden an event comes along and puts you back in reality and say, okay, you got to work a little harder. Her first Olympic medal came in 1984, a silver in the heptathlon. Four years later in Seoul, she exploded onto the world scene, winning the gold in both the heptathlon and the long jump. She always thought she'd do well in the heptathlon, but she really wanted to win her favorite event, the long jump. And on that fifth attempt, and I hit that board, and I just knew, I knew that was the winning jump because I heard it in the crowd, <laughs> and then I could hear Bobby. So I was like, I just didn't know what the distance was. It was just so uh, rewarding for me because I just knew at the age of nine that I could jump. <laughs> just give me an opportunity to jump. <laughs> all I can remember is all the people that cheered for me and that was there when no one knew Jackie Jordan Kersey, but like a coach for Noah who said you had the potential if you were willing to work hard and that uh, I stuck with it, but stuck with it because of the support of people telling me that you know, I could do it. Jackie Joyner Kersey won the gold again in the heptathlon in 1992 and finished with a bronze in the long jump in the 96 games. She retired from competition in 1998. Sports Illustrated for Women named her the female athlete of the 20th century. I never wanted to rest on my lowers. I never wanted them to say, oh, the former world record holder or and just be out there just to be out there. But being out there in the best shape of my life was the goal and to see if I was willing to be committed like that year after year after year. Today, Jackie Joyner Kersey leads a busy life, heading her own sports marketing firm, making motivational speeches, giving hope to fellow asthmatics, and raising funds for her Boys and Girls Club. I know that it would outlive me, and the mission and the vision would continue to live, and that it would be a focal point of this community where people can come and be proud uh, what was able to be built, uh, not only from a standpoint of it just being a facility, but also the young people that we would be able to develop and send out into this country that would eventually become great leaders and to say that they're from the community of East St. Louis. So uh, I continue to pray and hope that that would go according to the plan that I have set in my heart and mind. Being exposed to a community center and seeing how that community center made a difference in my life uh, not knowing at the age of nine what people consider a volunteer was at that time, but I knew it was people around all the time. So in return, I wanted to do the same. As I travel the world, I always talked about how important East St. Louis has always been to me and will always be to me. And when others would say negative things about my community, it would hurt me deeply because that's where I come from, that's where I'm from. So it was very important for me to let people know that there are great people in East St. Louis doing great things. So to the Lincoln Academy, I am very, very in debt to you, but I am very, very grateful and very, very honored. And I stand here alone, but it was many, many people that you would never read about and never hear about that deserves the credit. God bless you and thank you. Stephanie Pace Marshall is the founding president and the CEO of the Illinois Math and Science Academy in Aurora, Illinois. The Academy was founded to educate gifted secondary school students and to develop a new interdisciplinary curriculum based on problem-solving education. Stephanie is a visionary leader with a cap capacity to analyze the deep potential for creativity that lies deep within all of us. She is a powerful and compelling advocate for unleashing the human potential. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to present to you, as a laureate of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois, my friend Stephanie Pace Marshall. I want to create an environment for kids where they, they are fearless learners and that we create conditions for them to learn anything they want to learn when they're in the purview of the Illinois Math and Science Academy. Stephanie Pace Marshall credits her parents with giving her a lifelong love of learning. Her father was a nuclear engineer. Her mother was a special education teacher. I have always viewed myself as what I have called a child of the center. 
Uh, I grew up with Erector sets and music and, and taking apart cars and dolls. So I always, I, I was so fortunate to be in a home that really integrated from the very beginning um, math and science and art and humanities and music and of course growing up in New York which was a museum in and of itself uh, I had an unusual but very rich background. Marshall began her teaching career in Alsip, Illinois after her graduation from Queens College in New York. She became superintendent in Batavia in 1984 after earning her master's at the University of Chicago and doctorate at Loyola. Never satisfied with the status quo, she contacted other visionaries in her field. National and international leadership positions soon followed. And that brought me to a worldview um, that is essentially a very simple one, that um, mind shaping is world shaping. And that schooling is all, all about creating conditions that make the nurturance of certain kinds of minds and habits of thinking more likely. It's very different than uh, unfortunately, the conditions that are created in many schools uh, in the United States and in the Western world. In the early 1980s, Nobel laureate Leon Letterman was among many concerned that the United States was losing its leadership in science and technology. Letterman, at that time director of Fermilab at Batavia, called on the state's leaders to take bold action. Springfield listened, and Marshall, who was at that time Batavia school superintendent, eagerly joined Letterman in planning what would become the Illinois Mathematics and Science Academy at Aurora. This is an institution for kids of talent in math, science, and technology. Kids who have a passion for math and science, who are really motivated to study math and science, and who likely will go into a career in math and science. Uh, we've graduated almost 3,200 kids since the first graduating class of 1989. So this is a place for kids who understand their their talent and interest and motivation and desire to excel and study mathematics and science. Half the credits here are in mathematics and science. The IMSA curriculum stresses problem-based learning. Problem-based learning is a, is a curriculum and a way of teaching where kids are immersed in ill-structured, very messy problems for which there is no simple resolution. They have to um, examine first-hand data, frame the question, um, decide the multiple parameters that a question, uh, that resolving the question would take. Um, so they look at the scientific implications, the, the ethical implications, the moral implications, the historical implications, multiple ways of, how, of, of what a complex problem really involves. And then they have to resolve it, working in teams. Um, and then we bring in experts in the field to listen to their resolution and to push back at them. So it's, it's tremendous experience in immersing themselves in how the real world works. Statewide, IMSA provides leadership in math and science education through a wide variety of student enrichment programs, the Illinois Virtual High School, and professional development programs for teachers across Illinois. The teaching programs uh, focus on problem-based learning. Um, uh, they focused on information literacy. They focused on teaching. Um, science and mathematics, but also other disciplines as well, because PBL is one of those integrating uh, pedagogies that science teachers, math teachers, history teachers can all be working on. We've served about 18,000 teachers in the last 19 years. IMSA also influences educational policy at the state, national, and international levels, and has been used as the model for other math and science academies in Israel, Jordan, and Australia. Our policy initiatives uh, come from um, what we name and, and articulate as critical ingredients uh, uh, for education. So community, M IMSA had community service long before it became a state requirement. Whether, uh, could I say, could I claim that that was because of the Illinois Math and Science Academy? Perhaps not. Um, but, but the fact that we had it and we made that known, uh, I think probably had an influence. Were you able to plot some graphs and get any sense of what yeah, they're looking like? Book. Okay, you did, all right. Now approaching its 20th anniversary, IMSA continues to evolve as it realizes Marshall's vision of designing learning experiences that liberate the goodness and genius of children for the world. The metaphor that we use is a kaleidoscope, which is sort of the quintessential integrator of, of of science and art 
Um, and so we're trying to develop very holistic learners, um, integrative thinkers, kids who not only know math and science, but can connect it to other languages and disciplines as well, but who also have a very strong sense of social service and stewardship um, for, the, for the world. We call ourselves Infra for the World, and that's what we mean. Carl Sagan, who called the Illinois Mathematics and Science Academy a gift from the people of Illinois to the human future, also said, dreams are maps. Our children long for realistic maps of a future they can be proud of. Where are the cartographers of human purpose? Well, I am blessed that I have had remarkable cartographers along my way teachers, mentors, colleagues, family, and friends whose wise counsel and ever-present questions and probing enabled me to deeply explore the landscape of my own understanding about teaching and learning and schooling and the conditions that we create by design that either inhibit or enable learning to flourish. And those conversations have brought me to one simple truth. Mind shaping is world shaping. The learning conditions we immerse our children in by design will shape their minds and their minds will shape our future. Thank you all. The president of the Lincoln Academy is the Honorable Rod Blagojevich, governor of the state of Illinois. Elected as Illinois' 40th governor, he brings to this office a lifelong commitment to better the lives of all citizens. Since assuming office, the governor has continued to forward initiatives designed to protect and empower Illinois citizens. Joining us in the governor's stead is Dr. Thomas F. Schwartz, Illinois State Historian. His professional competence was recognized at the age of 38 when he became the youngest person ever appointed as Illinois State Historian. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to present Dr. Thomas F. Schwartz. It's my distinct pleasure and honor to be here tonight representing Governor Blagojevich. There's a vague notion that history is best written and remembered only after the participants are dead and after much study and reflection. The passage of time allows for reflection and sober analysis without the interference of special pleading or partisan influence that frequently characterize the writings of, of the historical actors themselves. I was also reminded in graduate school by a distinguished professor that historians do not even begin to reach a level of competency until they are at least 50 years old. Believing that a historian must experience enough of life and humankind to develop a broad sensibility and empathy for human capabilities and foibles. This wise scholar understood that the mind and heart are not distinct and antithetical poles, but a creative tension that made history, history interesting, compelling, and authentic. Having just turned 50, I have hope. The Lincoln Academy was created to recognize and honor the living histories who walk among us. Believing, as Lincoln did, that these living histories serve to remind their generation of what it has accomplishment, accomplished, they also serve to remind future generations of the endless possibilities ahead. Tonight, we come here to recognize the living histories of our own time. These individuals of accomplishment and achievement exemplify the highest ideals in their stated profession. Their lives and contributions to society have served not only to perpetuate our political institutions, but business, educational, athletic, journalism, and scientific institutions as well. In short, America is a better place because of them, and we are forever grateful to them. On behalf of Governor Blagojevich, I want to thank the Lincoln Academy for continuing its vital mission to recognize those individuals who best exemplify the Lincolns of our time. And to the honorees, congratulations, a heartfelt thanks for what you have achieved and continued success in the years to come. Thank you.